Located in the middle of the old city of Jerusalem lies one of the most famous structures in the world. In addition to being a visible symbol of the city, it lies on a plot of land that is one of the most historical and contested pieces of property on the planet. It's been a center of controversy for thousands of years and looks to continue to do so for at least several hundred more. Learn more about the Dome of the Rock and the ground it sits on on this episode of Everything Everywhere Daily. This episode is sponsored by ButcherBox. Regular listeners to this show know that I'm a big fan of ButcherBox. They're a service that sends boxes of high-quality meat and seafood delivered directly to your door. ButcherBox procures only the highest quality grass-fed beef, heritage pork, free-range chickens, and wild-caught seafood. You select the box that you want, and then they ship it to you freshly frozen. I had some New York strip steaks from ButcherBox just the other night, and they were delicious. I put them in a new air fryer I just purchased. I put a meat thermometer in the steak, programmed it for medium rare, and it came out perfect. Right now, ButcherBox is running an offer for new members. New members will get a free flank steak in every box for the next three months. To start getting the best quality meats and a free flank steak for three months, sign up at ButcherBox.com daily. Once again, log on to ButcherBox.com daily to get free flank steak for three months. This episode is sponsored by the Expedition Unknown podcast. Many of you may know Josh Gates as the host of the Discovery Channel television show Expedition Unknown. The Expedition Unknown podcast from Discovery chronicles the adventures of Josh Gates as he investigates unsolved iconic stories from across the globe. With direct audio from the hit TV show of the same name, you'll hear Josh explore stories like the disappearance of Amelia Earhart in the South Pacific and the location of Captain Morgan's treasure in Panama. These authentic roughshod journeys help Josh separate fact from fiction and learn the truth behind these compelling stories. In one episode, Josh travels to the remote and landmine-riddled jungles of Cambodia to investigate the lost city of the Khmer Empire and search for a mystical relic that gave its god-king the power to incinerate his enemies. In another, Josh travels through Russia and Germany looking for stolen objects of great value pillaged by the Nazis during World War II. And in another, he goes to Peru to uncover the meaning behind the giant geoglyphs drawn into the earth hundreds of years ago. If you're a fan of this podcast, you will almost certainly love Josh's take on the subjects that he tackles around the globe. Listen to Expedition Unknown wherever you get your podcasts. Once again, that's Expedition Unknown. Any discussion of the Dome of the Rock has to start with the place it's located. Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Jerusalem dates back to biblical accounts. According to these accounts, the city was founded by King David, the leader of the unified kingdoms of Israel and Judah sometime around the year 1000 BC. According to archaeological evidence, the location probably had some sort of human settlement at least 2000 to 3000 years before that. Again, according to biblical accounts, the reason why this place was selected was for the creation of a Jewish temple. The temple was the singular focal point of the entire Jewish religion. There was only one temple, and it held the Ark of the Covenant, on which I've done a previous episode. And it was the location where ritual sacrifices were made. The first temple was built by David's son, King Solomon, on the top of a hill in the city that we know today as Temple Mount. The site was initially said to have been a spot for threshing wheat due to its exposed rock outcrop. According to tradition, it was the spot where Abraham bound Isaac, and it was also the place where the creation of the world began. The first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC during the siege of Jerusalem. A second temple was built in the same spot. Construction on it began just decades after the first temple was destroyed, but it was given a major renovation by Herod the Great, who was a Jewish king who lived in the first century BC. The second temple is widely known as Herod's Temple. The second temple was destroyed in the year 70 by the Romans during a Jewish uprising. The topic of the Jewish temple that I'm kind of glossing over is going to be the subject of a future episode. With the second temple destroyed, the Romans built a pagan temple to Jupiter on its site. After Emperor Constantine I converted to Christianity, the pagan temple was destroyed in 325 on his orders. In 363, according to legend, Emperor Julian, the nephew of Constantine, gave permission for Jews to rebuild their temple but an earthquake stopped those efforts. In 610, Jerusalem was briefly conquered by the Persian Sassanid Empire, who gave control of the city back to the Jews. 
they began constructing a new temple until the Sassanids gave control of the city back to the Christians, who tore everything down and used the site as a garbage dump. The site was taken back by the Byzantines in 615 and was subsequently conquered by the Rashidun Caliphate under the Caliph Omar in 637, which is where the story of the Dome of the Rock really gets started. Again, according to legend, the Caliph Umar was taken to the Temple Mount and was shown the location by a rabbi who had converted to Islam by the name of Kappa al-Akbar. Al-Akbar recommended to the Caliph that he build a mosque to the north of the rock so it would face both the rock and Mecca. For whatever reason, Umar built his mosque to the south of the rock. Here I should note the significance of the Temple Mount in Islam. For the most part, Islam holds the same beliefs that Judaism has about the significance of the rock and Temple Mount. However, in addition, they hold that it was the site where the Prophet Muhammad landed during his night journey. The night journey is detailed in both the Quran and the Hadith, which tells of how Muhammad traveled from Mecca to Jerusalem in a single night on the back of a heavenly creature known as a Barak. The place he is believed to have landed was the foundation stone on Temple Mount, and it was the place from which he also flew into heaven. It wasn't until several decades later, around the year 690, during the Umayyad Caliphate and the reign of the Caliph Abdid al-Malik, that permanent structures were built. The mosque, which had been refurbished and expanded many times throughout its history, is the Al-Asqa Mosque, which means the furthest mosque. On the rock at the top of the Temple Mount was built an eight-sided structure with a wooden dome. The name of the building in Arabic is Kubat as Shakra, which roughly translates to Dome of the Rock. The building's design was based on the architecture of Byzantine churches in the region. At the time, a dome was rarely used in Islamic architecture, and it was thought that the caliph wanted to make a statement by creating a building that would rival the domes of Christian churches. Here I should address a popular point of confusion about the Dome of the Rock, and it's easy to see where the confusion lies. The Dome of the Rock is not the al Asqa Mosque. The al Asqa Mosque is only about 140 meters due south of the Dome of the Rock. The entire compound on the Temple Mount is often referred to as al Asqa, and this would include both the Mosque and the Dome of the Rock, which is where the confusion comes from. The actual term for the entire compound is the Noble Sanctuary, or Haram al-Sharif. Another area of confusion is if the Dome of the Rock is itself a Mosque, I've actually had this discussion with several Muslims in Jerusalem, and I've been told everything from, of course it is, to, no it's not. In most texts, the Dome of the Rock is referred to as an Islamic shrine, not a mosque. This is due in no small part to the fact that one of the largest and most important mosques in the world is literally just a few steps away. If you think of a mosque as a building with a large amount of floor space for worshippers and regular prayer services, then the Dome of the Rock would not be a mosque. However, people can and do pray there, so it also isn't not not a mosque. The initial building was damaged by several earthquakes in 1808 and 1846. It finally collapsed in 1015 and was rebuilt in the year 1022. This rebuilt building is the one that's standing today, and by all accounts, it was rebuilt to look very similar to the original structure. In 1099, Christian crusaders captured Jerusalem. The al Asqa Mosque was converted into the headquarters for the Knights Templar. The Dome of the Rock was given to the Augustinian religious order and converted into a church. The Dome of the Rock had a special significance to the Templars as it was the site of Solomon's Temple. The image of the dome became one of the symbols of the Knights Templar and appeared on their official seals. Crusader rule over Jerusalem came to an end on October 2, 1187, when Saladin, the founder of the Ayyubid dynasty, captured Jerusalem. The site was once again concentrated as a Muslim shrine, and the cross on the top of the dome was replaced with a crescent. During the Ayyubid dynasty, which lasted about 250 years, the dome was frequently the beneficiary of donations by its rulers. In 1517, Jerusalem was conquered yet again by Suleiman the Magnificent, and began 400 years of Ottoman rule. One of the biggest changes to the structure during this period was the addition of tiles to the exterior of the building which Suleiman undertook. There is also new artwork inside the building and other small additions, such as the Dome of the Prophet, which was built in 1620. The Dome of the Prophet sounds very awe-inspiring, but in reality, it's just a small gazebo next to the main structure. The Ottomans invested in a major renovation of the building in the early 19th century, which included painstakingly replacing the external tile with replicas made in Constantinople. 
The British took control of Jerusalem from the Ottomans in 1917 and created the position of the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. The Grand Mufti is simply the Muslim cleric who is responsible for the administration of the Islamic holy sites in Jerusalem, including the Dome of the Rock. On July 11, 1927, another major earthquake hit Jerusalem, this time collapsing part of the dome and causing the walls to crack. In 1948, after the First Arab-Israeli War, the Temple Mount area and the entire Old City of Jerusalem came under the direct control of the nation of Jordan. You might have noticed that up until this point, I haven't uttered the one word that probably comes to mind when you think of the Dome of the Rock, the thing which is the single most defining characteristic of the building, gold. Until 1959, the Dome of the Rock was actually covered in lead. The shape of the dome was its defining feature, not its color. Starting in 1959, extensive renovations paid for by the King of Jordan replaced the lead panels on the dome with a lighter and more durable panel made of an aluminum bronze alloy. These new alloy plates were then covered in gold leaf. It completely changed the image of the building and made it stand out from the rest of the old city of Jerusalem from a distance. The dome once again changed hands in 1967 with the Six-Day War. All of East Jerusalem, including the Temple Mount and the Dome of the Rock, now fell under Israeli control. This, for obvious reasons, was a huge potential source of trouble. Just days after the war ended, a meeting was held between Israeli officials and Muslim religious authorities in Jerusalem. They hammered out an agreement regarding the Temple Mount, which mostly still stands today and seemingly satisfied no one. The agreement stated that the Dome of the Rock and the Temple Mount is under Muslim religious control. Non-Muslims may visit the area, but may not pray or have any other public displays of religion. I've actually visited the Dome of the Rock on two separate occasions, but I've never been able to go inside. Many rabbis have issued decrees prohibiting Jews from entering the Temple Mount area, as ancient biblical requirements for entering the Temple have yet to be met. And even those rabbis who disagree with the general ban on entering the Temple Mount forbid entering the Dome of the Rock for the same reasons. The Dome of the Rock is one of the most iconic buildings in the world, a status which it has only solidified since it was covered in gold leaf in the early 1960s. It is one of the oldest existing Islamic religious structures still standing and has become so identified with Islam that it appears on the currency in several Muslim countries. It also occupies a spot of land that is probably the most contested and controversial place in world history. Given the political and religious forces at play, it's likely that the Dome of the Rock will remain the center of controversy and intrigue for centuries to come. The executive producer of Everything Everywhere Daily is Charles Daniel. The associate producers are Thor Thompson and Peter Bennett. Today's review comes from listener Anonymous Magnet Beast on Apple Podcasts in the United States. They write, quite good. As clean as history will allow, as Gary himself once put it. Pleasantly monotonous, with dry humor throughout. I've learned so much my mother is sometimes discouraged whilst trying to teach me history because I know it all. I am 13. I'm about 14 episodes away from the Completionist Club. I would love to hear episodes about mythical creatures or constructed languages. Congratulations on a complete show page background on Apple Podcasts. Thank you, Anonymous Magnet Beast. I think you've discovered the downside to listening to this show. Listen long enough and it'll eventually cover everything. As for your episode ideas, as they say in Klingon, Parhachwal Tahi Vilharga. Remember, if you leave a review or send me a boostagram, you too can have it right on the show.